folks, welcome to iCube episode 46. 46. Wow. Amazing. So, I have a repeat guest today. I'm excited about this because he was a fantastic guest. One of my favorite guests on, on iCube. Without a doubt, one of my favorite guests on iCube. And when he was on last year with this miraculous case we talked about, he yeah. promised he would come back. So, I am so excited today to have Ali Raja back. Hello, Alan. Welcome back to IQ. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Alex. It's really great to be back here. I had a ton of fun last time. And so it's really great to come back and, and talk about the case, but also a trial that relates to it so perfectly. Absolutely. Exciting, exciting information or trial results. So um, I'm going to ask you to briefly introduce yourself, Ali. Perfect. Yeah. So my name is Ali Raja. I'm an emergency physician at Mass General uh, here in Boston. And um, it is just started. It's basically the end of summer here, and it's starting to turn super cold. So this uh, this is we've had our thirty five seconds of warm weather in Boston, and now we're going to get back to the winter, which is what we're all used to. Well, Ali, it's been a frigid seventy nine degrees. Oh God, stop it! <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's just dive in now, folks. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch episode thirty one, but it was. September 2019. If you haven't a whole chance, different world. Oh my goodness, the world is so different. <laughs> yes, that's true. That was pre-COVID. So mm -hmm. if you've not watched that episode with Ali Raj and myself, you need to go back and watch the whole thing because there was a lot of great, great learning there. But I'm going to play for you the patient scenario because it was my best case last year. So here we go. So this is a 66-year-old male who has a history of agoraphobia and he comes to the emergency department with chest pain, right? Got it. Let me just set up the scenario. So um, apparently the patient had gone unconscious in the hallway. So I go over to the hallway and um, I saw this very large unconscious man um, on the EMS gurney. I mean, it's sitting, he, the patient is on the gurney in the hallway. So um, just as I was trying to get a little bit of history from the EMS guys, the patient kind of starts having this tonic, clonic, jerking kind of activity, um, like a seizure and the nurse says, it looks like VTAC because they, he was on the uh, stretcher with the monitor from EMS, right? So yeah. I couldn't really see what the rhythm was. So they just kind of threw the guy on the bed. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this is what the this is what the pre-hospital, can you see that? This is what the pre-hospital monitor EKG is. I don't know if you can yeah. But I had a moment to look at the EKG. This is before he passed out, okay, or, or went into this sort of seizure-like activity. So... We get him on the monitor really quickly on the bed, and this is what we see. Oh, no, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> that's not at all what you just showed me. I know, I know. So we know that something's changed, obviously, because clinically he's unconscious now. So CPR gets started. We see that his uh, course V fib, and we shock him, and you can see that on the monitor strip. So it was, we, we're a community hospital. We don't have a mechanical device, so we do have the the staff kind of rotating, we have ED techs, we have the nurses rotating, EMS was there, so they were rotating to try to do the CPR. We have multiple other people in the, um, in the uh, room, obviously. So I managed to intubate the patient. He's in refib, so defibrillate him at 200, you know, nothing, right? So we do that actually four times in a row, and in the meantime, I've called out for Lido, Amio, Vicar, just in case it's hyperpay, and uh, calcium, right? So we are doing CPR. We are doing these um, uh, defibrillations without any effect at all, right? So then I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, what, 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 what? I'm thinking, I'm going through my head all the things that you had to do for VFIP. And I thought, dual pads. Yeah. So that was like my thought. Okay, let's just try. So we slap on a second pad, set of pads. I said to them, put the second pad in the front and in the back and just let's try the two pads, right? So we shocked him once. We shot him twice, nothing. We shot him three times, nothing. And I'm going, oh my gosh, what's going on, right? And so I go out, actually, I actually go out to the hallway and I talk to the mom, elderly mom. I said, you know, we've done everything and I really don't know if there's anything more we can offer, right? So I'll go, I go back into the room. I go, okay, where's my, my ultrasound? I do a poke at the bedside because, you know, if he had no heart activity, maybe we shouldn't continue, right? And this is roughly, I can't be precise, but this is roughly about 20 minutes into it. Something right. like that. And how many times have you dual sequentially shocked him now? You said yeah, three, times. three times already. Wow. Three times, nothing. Okay, I talk to mom. I get my bedside ultrasound. Yep. 
and I'm slapping on to get a quick look because if there's no cardiac activity, we're not going to continue, right? I look at the heart, the pocus, and there's disorganized cardiac activity. It's still fibrillating. So We've got to keep going, right? Yeah. yeah. So then at that <laughs> time, one of the ED techs looks at the pad. He looks up at me and he goes, Dr. Lee, is this pad here supposed to be in the back? <laughs> I'm like, yes. I told him one in the front, one in the back. Oh, no. Yeah, right. So the tech changes that pad and puts it in the back. And now we're shocking him for the eighth time in total. And yep. this is the fourth time of 400 joules. And we're roughly 22 minutes into it, 25 minutes into it. And we shock him. And I look on the monitor. And for the first time, I actually see a rhythm. Wow. I actually see this very slow, wide, complex rhythm. And I'm yelling, is there a pulse? Is there a pulse? No pulse. So I'm like, okay, epinephrine, continue CPR. And we would go another two minutes of CPR, like they recommend, right, in ACLS. Yep. And, he's, yep. and now he's got a pulse, and he's got a pressure. And it, we get an EKG, and he's got an ST elevation STEMI. Wow. V1, V2, and V3, okay? Wow. So I'm like, okay, we need to call the cardiologist on call, right? So now he is, he's got ROSC. He's got ROSC. I mean, he had that epi, yep. and he has ROSC. I, I activate the hypothermia, I, and then... I call out the cardiologist who happened to be in the ER. So I show him this EKG. Yeah, exactly. I show him this EKG and he goes, oh, that's a STEMI. I said, yeah, we just showed <laughs> <laughs> I was just showing it to you for your opinion. I didn't know what it was. Why don't you tell me what right, it was? Right, no, yeah, so I said, I said, we just shot the guy eight times with double, I mean, four times the dual pads. He's got a STEMI, yeah. So long story short, this, we, we lost that initial EKG and I'm very uh, um, sad about that. but. Uh, the cardiologist takes him to a cath lab, right? And, and it, uh, it's a near, near uh, total uh, occlusion of the left anterior descending coronary artery, and wow. he puts a stent in it. So happy ending um, after the stent. This is his EKG. That's amazing. And I know. He actually left the hospital reportedly neurologically intact two weeks later. Okay. <laughs> That, that was fantastic, and it just brought me back to how exciting that case was the first time around. <laughs> I listened to that a couple of times in preparation for this episode, and I laugh. I burst out literally LOL each time because it's so funny, and you were so great. Your response was so spontaneous and just the kind of responses <laughs> that is great for a uh, you know, uh, a, a video blog. Well, my favorite part of that is just, you know, the cardiologist looking at the EKG now and saying, yep, yeah, that's systemic. And you're like, yes, I know. That is why I am showing it to you. <laughs> so at the end of that uh, episode, Ali informed me that there was actually a, a study called Dose VF. I want to give you guys a little bit of a background to explain this because I was um, not familiar with these, this trial either. So uh, Ali mentioned this trial, the dose VF, but this is actually the main trial. That's not, it's not completed yet. Um, it started back in September last year, 2019, and it will end September 2022. They anticipate enrolling maybe 930 participants. So this is the main dose VF trial, okay? Alice, just one quick thing on that last slide. If you go back, you'll see, if you zoom in a little bit, that this last update was posted October 23rd of 2019. Oh. And so they haven't updated this webpage since October of 2019. So unfortunately, just with COVID and everything else, I bet it's actually going to have to go back beyond September of 2022. Yeah, you're right. You know, that makes the value of the pilot study even more, doesn't Such it? Such a good point. You're totally right. At least we have something. And this is the article that was published just this a uh, couple months ago called Double Sequential External Defibrillation for Refractory VFib, the Dose VF Pilot Randomized Controlled Trial. Now, this trial, this pilot study started in March of 2018, and it completed in September of 2019. This was a three-arm crossover pilot RCT that was conducted over 12 months, okay? It involved four EMS services in Ontario, Canada. Each of the EMS agencies switched strategies after six months. Um, there's random assignment, computer-generated random assignment of 
uh, strategy after three standard defibrillation attempts, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I am very much a visual learner, so I felt compelled to um, drag this on a little bit, explain it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, no, the pictures definitely help in this kind of thing because yeah, you know, oh, it's totally. basically we know that strategy three is, is essentially strategy one plus strategy two, but trying to picture where all the pads go and everything, as you found out in that case we talked about, right? It's easy to misplace the pads, so the pictures are great. Yeah, and in my case, it made a critical difference, I think. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, so then strategy one is your regular anterior lateral. Strategy two is your front and back, right? And strategy three is both one, which is one front and side, and then front and back. So these four pads are not touching each other, and that's uh, the dual sequential external defibrillation strategy. All these uh, strategies would allow for your standard ACLS, you know, epinephrine or um, uh, other antiarrhythmic uh, meds, right? The inclusion criteria wa was the following. Adults greater than 18 years of age, these are non-traumatic, out-of-hospital cardiac arrests of presumed cardiac cause. Um, the patient has to still be in VF after three standard defibrillation shocks. The exclusion criteria, they cannot be traumatic cardiac arrests. That makes sense. Uh, they are DNR, obvious. Um, they did not include pulseless VTAC. And then the cardiac arrest due to drowning, hypothermia, hanging, or suspected drug overdoses were not included in this study. You know, I was very impressed when I read the article <laughs> how much effort they really put into this, right? Canadians are amazing. They do all sorts of cool stuff like this. <laughs> and, you know, and... My practice, which is in Arizona, we have lots of Canadian snowbirds that spend the winter here, right? right. And uniformly, everyone is so nice. They're so patient. They, they could be right. waiting four hours in the waiting room, and they're still really nice and polite. Um, anyway, so I was very, very impressed with the um, amount of effort and planning that went into this particular uh, study. So the paramedic training and oversight was um, provided by the Sunnybrook Center of Pre-Hospital Medicine. 2,500, 2,500 paramedics were trained. That's a huge number. And the training consisted of one hour lecture plus two hours of either video or simulations on uh, technique of the vector change uh, and, the, and the dual sequential external defibrillation. And there were monthly updates by the investigators. The medical directors provided constant feedback to all these agencies um, uh, of their performance. It's you know, really, when I really first saw this, I, I thought, wow, that is a ton of work for 152 patients. <laughs> but as, as you already said, Alice, right, this leads right into the real dose VF trial that's looking to enroll 900 something patients. Right. And so when we remember that it's the pilot study plus the much bigger real study, this kind of training actually seems to make a lot more sense. So let's go through this uh, chart just a little bit in detail because I think it's important just to get an idea, like a global uh, understanding of this uh, study. They uh, had 150 uh, patients eventually that uh, were included and enrolled. Uh, they didn't exclude anybody, actually. They had uh, 36 patients out of 152, or nearly 24% of the patients were uh, assigned to the standard treatment, okay? Then 61 patients or 40% was aligned, assigned to the vector change strategy. And then 55 patients out of 152, which is 36% or so, uh, assigned to the dual sequential uh, external defibrillation step strategy. So out of the 61 patients as assigned to the vector change, actually 51 received the defibrillation strategy, and then 10 didn't because uh, the termination of VFib occurred prior to them putting the pads on. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the dual sequential external defibrillation co cohort of, of patients, there's 55 of them, and then 49 out of the 55 actually received the dual sequential uh, defibrillation. Um, six of them didn't because there were no, there was not a second defibrillator available. Now that's oh, just, I didn't yeah. actually, you, I didn't notice that. You picked that up. Nice pickup, um, which well, is interesting because these were randomized to, like these were study paramedics. So you'd think they would have a second defibrillator. But that's real life, right? I mean, that's real life. They, the second defibrillator, and the, if you look at the uh, details in the article, the second defibrillator is either from fire or for an mm -hmm. from another uh, AMBO. But you can't yeah. always rely on having another AMBO, right? And so anyway, 
if you look in the bottom three boxes, these are the results. Um, 24 patients out of 36 in the uh, standard cohort had VF termination. So 66.6%, okay? And then in the v, uh, vector change cohort, 82% had termination of VF. Then the dual sequential cohort, you had 76% of VFib termination. In terms of ROSC, that's also another really interesting uh, finding. Yep. Um, in the standard group, uh, ROSC at any time was 25%. The vector change group, almost 40% had ROSC yeah. at any time. And then the dual sequential group, um, for all, uh, also 40% had ROSC at any time. Now, the very last uh, result to, to take note of, and it's, it's, it's an interesting result because this is what happens in real life. You can get ROSC in the AMBO, and then they lose it again, and, and they don't have ROSC when you get to the ER. But so the very last result on the bottom of the slide here, and the stand in the standard group, only 19% had ROSC at uh, arrival in the ER. In the um, vector change group, nearly 25% had ROSC uh, at the presentation, um, as as opposed to 39% uh, you know on route. And then with the dual sequential, 32 almost 33% had yep. ROSC upon arrival versus the 40% you know on route. So you know I I. As you know, I try to kind of boil things down, and the, the author's conclusion I agree with, which is findings from our pilot RCT suggest that dose VF protocol is feasible and safe. Rates of VFib termination and ROSC were higher in the vector change and dual sequential external defibrillation than the standard defibrillation. The results of this pilot trial will allow us to inform a multi-center cluster RCT with crossover to determine if alternate defibrillation strategies for refractory VFib may impact patient-centered clinical outcomes. I really agree with this. What do you think? I, I totally agree. And you know, the thing is that I love that this pilot go, uh, study's goal was really just to determine whether or not it's feasible. So they tried to say, hey, can we get more than 80% of the patients randomized mm -hmm. to one of these three arms? Can we actually do this? Is it possible to take a patient who's in VF and whom we're performing CPR and flip them a little bit and put a second set of pads anteriorly and posteriorly? Well, it turns out it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then secondly, is it safe? Are we going to end up with burns to the chest wall? Right. Are we going to short out our defibrillators? Are, are people going to be really uncomfortable and not willing to do this? And it turns out that didn't happen either. So it accomplished the goals of feasibility and safety. And we can really dig into patient outcomes with the larger randomized trial that's coming up. Well, Ali, that's fantastic because you, that's going to lead me right into my learning focus number one. <laughs> I feel like you need theme songs for learning focus number one. Time for learning focus number one. All right, folks. Learning focus number one, you've come to expect this, right? Because we just can't possibly talk about everything that's relevant. Uh, we'll try to talk about the two major focuses. And number one, just like Ali mentioned, this study that's published is both a pilot study and a feasibility study. Well, when I read that, I'm like, what? What does that mean? I had no idea what a feasibility study means. <laughs> so, of course, if I don't know, I'm looking it up, right? So, the this article uh, defines feasibility in pilot, very, pilot study very well. Um, a feasibility study asks whether something can be done, should we proceed with it, and if so, how? A pilot study asks the same questions, but also has a specific design feature. In a pilot study, a future study or part of a future study is conducted on a smaller scale. That's what a pilot study is. And that's what uh, Ali was uh, explaining too. All right. In terms of this particular study, their feasibility goals were actually all met. So number one, successful delivery of allocated intervention. They wanted uh, to achieve 80%. Well, it was 89.5%. And then delivery of intervention shock before the sixth shock was also 80%. Uh, the feasibility goal was 80%. And they had 93.1%. And then they wanted at least 110 patients enrolled. Well, they got 152, right? 
there were no report of injuries, either from family or from staff or medics or anything. So all of their feasibility goals were met. All right. So learning focus number two, VF termination and ROSC. The second point I really want us to think about is the results, even though it's not conclusive, I want us to think about the results that actually uh, occurred with the VF termination and ROSC. Um, it is not, this study was not a patient-centered outcome study because all they did was reported the short-term outcome, which was ROSC and VF termination, right? We cannot make any uh, conclusions regarding the effectiveness of vector change or do sequential defibrillation in refractory VFib based on the results of this small pilot study. But <laughs> I want to point out the results again, right? Um, VF termination was better in the vector change group and then do a sequential group. ROSC at any time was better in the vector change group and the dual sequential group compared to standard. And then ROSC got uh, emergency department arrival, even though uh, it declined both, uh, in both of uh, intervention groups, they were still better than the standard group. <laughs> I'm very optimistic based on these results. What do you think? Also, I agree. I think I'm optimistic as well. The one interesting thing that's just, it's important to point out, and I'm not trying to quibble, but I, um, we don't really know if it was better. And, and the reason is that these authors, in, in, uh, it, they did a ton of work and they put out this pilot study, but what they didn't give us is they never actually gave us confidence intervals around any of these percentages. And with a study with only 150-ish patients, it's a little hard, especially when you're dividing them into three different groups uh -huh. to come up with a truly statistically significant difference. So I agree with you. I think that 76% is better than 66% when we compare double sequential to standard for VF termination. I think that looks better and it's, it's probably not, in fact, it's definitely not worse. There's no way that it could be worse, right. but it's hard to say that it's better because we don't know if the confidence intervals really overlap. So I think that's where this larger study is going to be able to tell better or not. But at the very least, we know that it's not worse. Right. And there's no reason that for those of us who are doing it, that we should stop doing it based on the study. We should keep doing it. And then hopefully the larger study, well, not hopefully, I just want whatever's best for the patient, but the larger study should be able to tell us whether or not dual sequential is truly better, statistically better than standard. Yeah. I, I really appreciate this article because it really is the very first sort of RCT looking at a dual sequential and very, very stringent sort of uh, inclusion criteria and the, uh, the way they carried it out versus like we talked about in the past, all these other case series, there was such heterogeneity in the way the patients were uh, defibrillated and who was included and when the dual sequential was being um, applied, you know, was it the fourth time or was it the tenth time? There was just uh, really a mix of uh, factors in all these previous case studies um, that this is being the first one with this very, very uh, strict um, protocol is even though it's not blaringly um, pro do a sequential it is a good good study and uh, I think we should continue to do it like this in the main trial but I can't wait to see what that's going to show because this does sort of trend towards positive but it's just very small numbers you know so Ali thank you so much for coming back do you have any other um words of his wisdom or something to share about this? No, I, think, I think the main thing is, is what we just went over. You know, I am equally excited about dual sequential defibrillation. I think it's wonderful. This study supports that it is safe, that it's feasible, that we should be talking to our nurses and our techs about it when we have somebody come in with cardiac arrest. Because, uh, you know, as you know, um, we probably don't want to introduce this in the middle of an arrest. Right. If anything, we want to prep the team for it beforehand. We want to say, okay, if I'm going to have to shock them, I'm going to try three times, four times, however many times you want to do it. And then I may bring in a second defibrillator. And when I do, we're going to put it on the front and the back or do the anterior lateral approach if it's already on the front and the back. Um, 
because communication during a code is exceptionally important and right. trying to surprise the rest of your team by finding another defibrillator is never going to go well. Um, the, the second thing is that while I'm super excited about it and now we know it's safe and it's feasible, I'm really, really excited about this larger randomized control trial that will hopefully find a statistically significant difference between the two groups showing us that it's it's not just safe and feasible, but it's also more effective. And yeah. it, you know, it, it's likely going to take until 2022 or later to get that. Um, but hopefully as soon as they're done with it, they'll be able to publish it. And, and so all this training, uh, it takes a ton of work and hats off to the, to the folks who designed this study. All right, folks. Thank you so much for coming back to my blog every month to watch us uh, talk about real cases and really dissect to them. I hope that everybody's still wearing the PPE, okay? Don't give up on that. Please protect yourself so that you can serve your community. They need you, okay? Ali, thank you so much for coming back. This has been great. Thanks, Alice. It was a blast. It's always a fun time. You do a great job with those PowerPoint decks. And uh, thanks for doing such a great job and inviting you back. All righty. Wonderful. So we'll see you. Um, unfortunately, we, I won't be seeing you at ASAP this year. <laughs> Not <laughs> this year. Like, hopefully, hopefully next year when, yeah, it's, uh, when it's back in person. Yeah, wonderful. All right, folks. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next month. Bye.